you would take your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 3, <clears throat> picking up where we left off this week with verse 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, the apostle under inspiration of God says, for no foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus? Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple? You are. The verses that opened this worship service this morning were, of course, no mistake that God's ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts, that his ways are far above ours. Uh, what God is doing with his creation is far more wondrous and glorious than even language can properly express under the curse. What God is doing with his elect, with his children, is actually far more exciting and unique than can even be comprehended beyond language. The Bible is full of images and illustrations, really in order to bring God's majesty, God's might, God's incomprehensibleness down to our level so that we can grasp certain aspects of who he is and what he's done. And he uses anthropomorphisms, he uses images, he uses illustrations, so that we can grasp. And this chapter is a good example of that. Last week, we discussed the imagery of Christ as the only foundation. He is the only foundation for life, the only foundation for salvation, the only foundation for motivation, for existence, for anything that truly matters. There is no other foundation, was really Paul's argument. There is nothing else that is going to stand. There is nothing else that will be counted worthy but Christ and Christ alone. He is the chief cornerstone. And this passage says, you are the building. And if your foundation is truly Christ, what are you doing as his building? What do you look like as his building? What are you building with? What are you building for? What are your goals in construction? And are you even building in the first place? Christianity is all about Jesus Christ. If it were about something else, it wouldn't be called Christianity. Christianity is all about Jesus Christ. Therefore, Christians are meant to be all about Jesus Christ. Your love and your foundation need to instruct the materials and actions of your life. Your foundation should fuel and should motivate and should influence even the edifice of you as the building. It's a common theme in my sermons that Christ alone and Christianity alone gives meaning and gives purpose in life. And the reason I keep it as a common theme is because I find that it is such a, a real 
and repetitive struggle for many people, especially in our age. It's a real struggle for people to find purpose and meaning. And they look for it in sometimes very bleak, very ridiculous ways. But Christianity provides the most purposeful, the most rich reasons for existence. It provides the most motivation for function and for enjoyment that there is. It does this because it instructs the Christian to do everything in love for Christ. And then it tells the Christian that everything that is done in love for Christ counts. Don't ever think that your life is meaningless or purposeless. What is done for Christ counts and is put on the building. You are presented in life with two general paths in everything. The way that seems right in your own eyes and that seems to serve you in the moment but contradicts God's instruction, contradicts God or the way that actually honors God. Now the way that honors God can seem in the moment to be detrimental. It can seem in the moment to cause you to lose out. But this is not true. As I've already said in my prayers twice this morning, he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And if God is sought, the reward is God himself. To pursue God is to build for a kingdom that is not of this world. Since it's not of this world, you may not see the immediate gratification, the immediate, re immediate results of building for that kingdom now as you go for it. But to build for God's kingdom is to recognize that the life giver and sustainer of all knows what's right and what's best. And when you step out in trust of him and choose his path and his way and build for him, not your own lusts, you recognize that there is more that you can ever ask or think given to you than that. When you commit your way to God, to Almighty God, to Christ Jesus, when you commit your way to him, you are building for your real home, your final existence. Not this temporary vapor, like James says it's a mist that is here and then passes away, like your breath in the cold. You are building and living and functioning for your eternal, forever state. And you must be reminded, as this passage reminds us, that only what is in Christ can be acceptable to God. So all things that you love must be done and must be laid and must be committed to Christ as he is that firm foundation, that cornerstone. All things must be set apart for him. All things that you love and that you are made of and that you have been gifted, if they are committed to him, if they're done in him, if they're done in his name, if they're done in love for him, you carry those things with you into eternity and in eternity they are actually glorified. And they don't have to be miraculous and marvelous things to be counted for the building of God person who works in manufacturing, who does a job well done and commits their work and their function to the Lord, carries that skill and that effort and that love and that craftsmanship or whatever into eternity. The person who is an artist, who creates music or paintings or pictures or writes literature, if that is done for the glory of God, the nourishment of that the research of that, the time spent in that, the thoughts in that, the creativity in that, 
if committed to Christ and done out of love for Christ, gets carried into eternity and is then glorified and placed on the building. The person who eats for the glory of God, enjoying the creation of raw materials and the craftsmanship that goes into that and committing their meal to the Lord, that enjoyment gets carried into eternity. Scholarship, learning, relationships, everything, everything that is not sin can be committed to Christ and carried into eternity. What you do as a Christian, if you take a function or an activity that the world might say is empty, is meaningless, is monotonous, is purposeless, unnoticed, you take that and you commit it to him and you make it solid. You make it real. You make it last because he's the one who gives the power and the might, and he's the one who takes it and transforms it. It's a love displayed in the Christian that cannot be hidden. We are all passionate about what we love. We express it in different ways, but the passion is there. And when you are living for love, it really cannot be hidden. So do what you love for Christ. You've heard it said, it's almost a cliche phrase, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. I think that the Christian can actually really take hold of that. And if you're really doing what you love, it's not going to be hidden. It's going to be on display. The world will see it. And when Christ says, let them see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven, yes, he's talking about the goodness of God applied and the actions of Christianity, certainly. He's also talking about how you build up God's temple and God's kingdom. It's true to the fullest in Christ. And in Christ, there should not be bitterness there should not be missed out opportunity. There shouldn't be any of that. There should be the display of commitment to your Savior because it's love for you. Salvation is all of God's grace. Never think for a moment, never think for a moment that this passage has anything to do with justification. Salvation is all of God's grace. Justification is by faith through grace in Christ alone. This passage has to do with your conscious role of sanctification. Sanctification is by grace too. Sanctification is by God's power too. But we do have a conscious role. I can pick up this paper. I can live for God. He's the force behind it. He's the influence. He gets all the credit. But I have a conscious role in that. And this passage is speaking to that aspect of Christianity. And this passage is saying that you can be saved, that your heart can have a love for God, but you can waste all the gifting on things that should never be wasted. It's akin to the parable of the sower. In the parable of the sower, there is the seed that is described that is thrown among thorns, weeds, and they choke that plant. That parable never tells us that that plant dies, but it says that that plant does not bear fruit. That plant exists, but that plant only exists. One would say that in the Christian illustration that's going on here, we are being warned to not be that plant among thorns and weeds, to not be choked by the world, and to not waste the gift of God and of knowing God. The weeds and thorns choke the word, 
And may we not be those who stand on the platform of Christ and then never build anything. You won't go to hell, but you've done nothing with what you've been given. The other parable that comes to mind is Christ's parable of the talents. One man does nothing with it. He buries it. We're to do something with what we've been given. And this passage works hand in hand with that. You'll be saved. You'll stand on the platform. But you'll have nothing to carry with you into eternity. When he says, fire will show the true merit, the house made of straw that was not made of straw with the commitment to Christ, but just made for your own pleasure, for your own ease, for your own glory, you burn up like the first, first beginning of a campfire kindle. It'll be gone. It won't last. It won't stand the test of the fire. And we know that when we stand before God's accountability seat, we'll have to give an account. God says, I've given you this. Here's what you've done with it. And we are to be warned from this passage not to find ourselves in a situation where we only did what served us and not him. See, God is not deceived. God is not deceived. Whatever the material might look like, whatever it might seem on the surface, God will see what it's truly made of. You can put on a good show here. You can fool people. You can appear to be a polished, godly, sincere citizen. But God knows your heart. And God knows your true desires. God knows your true love. I would, I would challenge you, caution you, encourage you to take the time now, to take the time this week to get honest with God and to figure out your motives for what you do through the day. I'm not saying, this passage is not saying that you necessarily have to radically change your life in what you do. But it does say that you've got to take what you do and think about the motives and change the motives radically if your motives are only self-serving. Is God in your motives? Is God's glory in your enjoyment? Is God's glory in your work? Is God's future being built up in all that you do and all that you say? We know that we're frail sinners. We know that we'll never be 100% perfect in this. But if our heart pursues him and our heart is desirous of him, these things count for eternity. And again, God will not be deceived. He knows that this is between you and God. You don't have to prove anything to me. You don't have to prove anything to the person sitting next to you. But you've got to live for God and build on his foundation. And what you want to get is the fullest potential of your salvation. And that can only come with really living for God. You want to get all that he has blessed, all that he has opened the door for, all that he dispenses out. And that comes with committing everything to him and resting on him day and night for all things. You cannot lose out with him. You cannot lose out in him. Don't get choked. But live and prosper for the glory and goodness of God. What are the rewards that he gives? He rewards people with himself. And when you rest in Christ and know that he has seen the mindset of your day. And the mindset of your day is truly for him and through him and to him and unto him. Well, then you have riches and rewards in heaven that come by being close to him and come by being blessed by him.
faith for his sanctifying purpose. Faith for him to set you more apart to him. Faith for him to build you up and make him make you closer to him. Faith that is real, not a veneer, not a paper, not paper, not straw, but solid gold, solid silver. For God is the reward himself. Heavenly rewards is one of those concepts that the scripture actually doesn't talk on too much. We'll, we'll, we'll have another sermon on that at some point in Corinthians. But Paul will bring it up again in Corinthians. But heavenly rewards are a concept that is actually not, it's not that broad or not that deeply taught in the scripture. And because of that, we have to make sure that we never fall into the pit of thinking that heavenly rewards are some type of uh, economic plan for heaven. Heavenly re rewards are not a system of compensation for the Christian. Heavenly rewards are not a system of competition for the Christian either. We are still dealing with illustration here when he talks about rewards. We are talking about something that is higher and bigger and mightier than our puny brains can grasp. And so we are he's using the language of rewards the person that recognizes heavenly rewards recognizes that they are least deserving of those rewards. The person that is going to receive the most reward in heaven is the person that knows that they are most unworthy of that reward. And that person isn't interested in accolades, isn't interested in crowns, isn't interested in medals, is really only interested in wanting God. And that's the heart of this. That's the heart of the true reward of heaven. More of God. God is completing his temple, and you're part of that. You want to be the greatest for God, the closest to God, and you want more of God. And so as you are living stones being built up for God's temple and you're taking this passage and thinking in the context of this passage and applying this passage and recognizing that you on his foundation are building up himself as part of his temple and you're adding to the edifice, you're adding to the structure. As you go through life and you're looking at life and you're saying, what can I do? What have I been given to do? What am I going to do today? You look at what's presented before you and you ask, does this have a place in God? Does this edify? Does this build me up? Paul's famous words, all things are lawful for me. I am so secure in Christ that nothing is, in, nothing is too much for his cross, but certainly all things are not, do not edify. All things are not good all things don't lead me to him. Many things lead me away from him, and I want to be a completed temple. I want his temple to be as wonderful as possible because I want him. And so even at the top of your outline, I have the verse from Proverbs where it says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently will find me. Riches and honor are with me, enduring riches and righteousness. He says, I love those who love me. More Jesus, more God, more holiness. This is what people don't grasp about the pursuit of holiness. The pursuit of holiness is not this horrific ascetic lifestyle of beating yourself with chains and whips, of denying yourself things that are good and, and pleasant. That's not holiness. Holiness is saying, I want more of Christ and I want all of my life to be committed unto Christ. And what does not lead me to Christ, what does not build me up in Christ, what does not cause me to love him more, I don't want. Holiness is separation unto Christ. And if God is the God of everything that is good, and God is the creator of everything in existence, then with holiness you have everything in him. The substances that you consume, food, drink, whatever, does it cause you to love God more or does it numb you and lead you away from God? Is it a way of self-medicating 
or is it a way of building up your faith? The content that you consume, does it lead you closer to God? Does it cause you to love him more? Or does it cause you to forget him and blank, blank him out? The people that you associate with most, do they lead you to God? Do they cause you to glorify and enjoy him more? Or when you're with them, you're barely, you're there, but you're barely, you're not even really functioning as someone who's a child of God. Do they lead you away from God? These are the ways we think. These are the ways we recognize what will be burned up and what will last. The heart of commendation to the person who appears before God, the heart of commendation, the well done that comes from God when we appear and he says, well done thou good and faithful servant. The heart of commendation is the one that never rests in the service itself. I am a minister of the gospel. I live to teach and preach the word. I minister his word to the saints. But I never look at that for my peace. I look at Christ for my peace. I never look at the work I do for God as a means to bolster my confidence. I look at Christ for my confidence. And when he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant, He's really commending Christ. You have trusted me. You have loved me. You have leaned on me. You have committed all to me. And the fruit that is in your life is from me and to me. Well done for believing and living and glorifying me. Well done, thou good and faithful servant, is not empty praise in that regard either but it is the final bell ring of celebration as we enter the eternal state as the temple of God where Christ is the light and Christ is the glory and Christ is the life and Christ is the truth and Christ is the all. Don't waste your life on self. Don't waste your life on things. Don't waste your life on things that only matter for you now here. But commit yourself to the Lord and you'll want for nothing. For he says again in Proverbs, my fruit is better than gold. Yes, than fine gold. And my revenue than choice silver. There is nothing that the materials of this world could ever purchase for you that is greater and better than what you have in Christ. Live for him, commit to him, enjoy him, glorify him, serve him, and adore him. Waste not, never want. Let's pray. Lord, help us to go through our lives committing all to you. We are only here by your bidding. You put us here for your purpose. Let's not get lost and distracted by the weeds and the thorns. We pray that we would enjoy everything for you and in you. And we pray that we would see your face and your hand in all things, and that everything is sanctified and set apart for you. Cause us by your power and grace to live that way. Because we live that way, to have the peace that passes all understanding, to have the joy that can never be taken away, to have the love that is truly in Christ Jesus, and to walk as you walked, but walk with you even as Enoch, that we might be taken and bask in your presence as the ultimate reward and the ultimate goal. All for Christ and in Christ. We thank you and praise you in his precious name. Amen.